your personal appearance at the Community Church of Boston maybe 11, 10, 11, 12 years ago to show my film, The Ghost of Jeju. And that was arranged by my dear friend, I've got to give her a shout out, is Joan Livingston. And a big thanks to Dean Stevenson. Now, for those of you who are watching, a little bit more of my background is probably helpful. I was born and raised in Maine. I have the Boston Red Sox, the Boston Celtics, the Boston Bruins. It was the Boston Patriots initially, but the New England Patriots in my blood. I've been to Boston many times. I've been to Fenway Park many times. And I went to school not very far from Boston, up in Hamilton, Massachusetts. Now, what a lot of people may not know about me, I studied to be a priest uh, in the Catholic Church with the Carmelite Order. And I was ordained a priest in 1971. And I served actively in Arizona for 14 years. Uh, I taught high school. I taught theology. Um, I worked in a parish. And I then later married. I've had a wonderful marriage for 23 years with three children. They're grown today. Two of them uh, have been in the U.S. Army. One of them is still in the Army. The older one has retired with a complete medical disability, a Green Beret. Uh, and I have a daughter who is living in Austin, Texas. Now, I'm really a little nervous about this presentation tonight because I don't know who all might be listening. And the reason I'm a little nervous is because of my position on Russia, my coming to live in Russia, and producing so many videos that many Americans call me a Putinista, an asset of the Kremlin, the Kremlin bot, and a traitor. So that's made me a little nervous. I don't know who's listening. Some of my family members have refused to talk to me and have rejected me, abandoned me. I can't tell you there's several dozen friends who have abandoned me, condemned me. And so that made me a little nervous in spite of the fact that I'm used to being in front of the camera, I'm used to giving talks and everything else, but I just don't know who might be listening today in the United States and maybe around the world who might find what I will say to you to be disturbing. Now, a shout out to David Rovitz. Your songs were beautiful. What's happening in Israel and Gaza today has captured the attention of the world. But I'm sad to say that the same situation that has been occurring in the Donbas region of Ukraine for the last 10 years has received no attention in the mainstream media and in people, millions of people around the world that are rising up in protest today. For 10 years, the Ukrainian neo-Nazi government funded, sponsored by the United States of America, the EU and NATO have killed more than 14,000 innocent men and children by bombing these two cities that are pro-Russian, ethnically Russians, who refuse to join the Kiev regime after the coup d'etat in 2014. I have been there myself and have documented what has happened there. It bothers me that the rest of the world has not connected the two events. They are similar in that the goal and the intent of Kiev 
is genocide in the Donbass region. They fire indiscriminately thousands of rockets and missiles and cluster bombs on these two cities that have no military presence whatsoever of Russia. They're destroying civilian infrastructure. And I've documented this. And so I wanted to make that connection, as David mentioned, that the, these two conflicts indeed are related by more than just the genocide of innocent people. They are connected because the United States of America has been and is behind and is funding both of these conflicts. I know everybody is aware of this in terms of Israel and Gaza, but not many people are aware of what's been happening in Ukraine and in the Donbass region. Now, <clears throat> I feel more comfortable. I'm glad to be back in Boston and virtually around the United States and, and maybe the world. Um, why did I come to Russia? In 2011, I was invited to go to Jeju Island in South Korea. My expenses were partially funded by a peace group in San Francisco. I was to go there and make a short film about a at that time, seven year long protest against the construction of a naval base in the tiny village of Kangjon to accommodate Obama's pivot to Asia. The people there, farmers and fishermen in a 500 year old village had been protesting against the construction of that base. I went there expecting to do maybe a 10 minute short documentary video on this conflict. What I found out in one month on Jeju Island in 2011 made me cry. My first film, The Ghost of Jeju, has been seen, I don't know how many tens of thousands of times around the world. It's been translated into seven languages, including Russian, and it just premiered here in Russia in November at the Sochi International Film Festival. What I discovered was the massacre of somewhere between 30 and 60,000 innocent peasants, villages living on Jeju Island at the hands and under the command of the United States military. I was ashamed and angered and I came home thinking, this is not about a 10 minute protest. This is about an atrocity that had been kept secret and classified until around the year 2000. The research I did led to a film that traced United States quest for world domination, full spectrum domination in their words, of the planet. This film has been extremely popular, was banned in the United States. I could not find an agent to have it screened. I had to travel the country two times to peace groups all around the country, showing it sometimes to three people, sometimes to 100, sometimes to 200 people. It was that film that changed my life. It woke me up to the lies that I had been told since childhood about the exceptionalism of the United States, about the pursuit of freedom and democracy around the world, about the beacon on the hill, a sign of the rest of the world of this new found democracy. And I came to realize 
It was all a lie. And because of that, in 2016, after traveling the country twice, I was invited to go to Odessa in the Ukraine on the second anniversary of the massacre at the trade union hall that occurred and took the lives of anywhere between 50 and 100 people and the criminals have still not been prosecuted. I was invited there as a journalist to provide protection for the mothers of those who died when they were conducting this memorial. I saw right-wing nationalists. I saw neo-Nazis with my own eyes. They threw rocks at our bus. But they did not do any further violent acts against the mothers and those of us who were gathered there. My eyes were opened again. I began to do research. The coup d'etat in 2014, two years prior, was orchestrated and funded by the United States of America, by Barack Obama's regime. Joe Biden was the vice president, embroiled up to his eyeballs in treason, in bribery. John McCain, Victoria Nuland, uh, Jeffrey Pyatt, the then U.S. ambassador, all involved in this violent overthrow of a democratically elected president in 2014. From 2014 to 2024, the United States has been funding Ukraine to more than $160 billion, maybe more. And that is not counting what the Ukraine is spending. Uh, excuse me, what the EU and NATO countries are spending. And they have conducted this war on the Donbass region. I realized then when I came to Russia in 2016 at the invitation of a group who were inviting people like myself, journalists, to see Russia up close and personal. And at that time, I visited Moscow for 10 days. My hosts were a group of members of the Communist Party who treated me with open arms, with love, with compassion, with a desire to show me their country and to tell me about what their party stands for today. I was shocked because they destroyed everything I had come to believe about the Soviet Union and communist ideology and the desire to take over the world. Well, from Moscow, I went to St. Petersburg. And from St. Petersburg, I had to come to Crimea because I had to find out for myself the truth about Crimea returning to Russia in 2014 after the coup d'etat in Kiev. I have to tell anybody who's listening, you cannot believe any of the lies and evil propaganda that the United States government and mainstream media has claimed that it was an illegal and violent annexation by Putin of Crimea. It's totally false. I've documented this with, with uh, interviews with journalists, with former military people, with university academics, with students, and they will all tell you that they willingly, overwhelmingly, some 97% who vo voted to return to Russia, Putin immediately accepted it. Crimea, for people who don't know, had been part of the Russian Empire since Catherine the Great in the 18th century, when she took it from the Ottoman Empire. And it was Khrushchev, Nikita Khrushchev, who deeded it to Ukraine. He didn't want any part of it. And I think it was 1954, if I'm not mistaken. The people in Crimea are ethnically Russians. They wanted to return to Russia from the beginning. They wanted no part of it. 
And so when I returned home from that trip, I made a short video. It's, it's on my YouTube channel now, which is Alfredo Baldick. My original YouTube channel was permanently deleted with over 550 films for posting things they didn't, they didn't like. But the film I made was Je suis Russia. I encourage anybody who hasn't seen it to look for me on YouTube at Alfredo Baldick and to watch that film. Now, I returned again in 2018 and 2019 with um, a group from California headed by Sharon Tennyson, CCI, the Center for Citizen Initiatives. She had been working in Russia for 40 years, bringing citizen diplomats. And I was brought along to document these two delegations in 2018 and 2017 and 2018. And I made several films. I even recorded a two hour personal session with our group with Mikhail Gorbachev. And coincidentally, most people in America think of Gorby. He was a hero. He worked with Reagan. He got, he got nuclear arms treaties done. He traveled around the country but I have to tell you here in Russia, he's not respected. He is the one they accused of dissolving the Soviet Union, selling out the people of Russia. And that led to Boris Yeltsin. So I had been absorbing all of this. And I had been paying close attention to when I was in Russia, the Russian people incredibly well-educated, much better educated than any of us in the United States. They knew more about Russian history, about American history, American authors, American politics than I did. The culture here has completely overwhelmed me. It's an ancient culture. It's a blend of 185 different ethnic groups joined by a language, Russian, who have been living peacefully for centuries. The art, the literature, the music is such that I have not ever experienced in my life. And I've studied in Rome. I've lived in Europe. I've been around the world. I've been to Asia. And I have never found such a rich culture and country as I found in Russia. Now, I'm willing to bet that people listening to me right now are saying he's crazy. He's lying through his teeth. He's a Kremlin asset. For anyone who is attempting to be objective and to search for the truth, I have tried through my work as a filmmaker to show people what Russia and Russian people are like. Now it was in 20, at the end of 2019, I was living in Maine at that time in an, an assisted living facility, uh, you know, funded, supported by the state. I, I couldn't afford to just live on my own anymore on simple social security, a small retirement. And my car broke down. I had a Subaru. And those of you in Boston know what it's like during winter when they put salt on the roads and your car rusts out. My secondhand Subaru rusted out. I couldn't get it certified to renew it. So I was without a vehicle. And I thought, you know, you're living in Maine, of all places, without a car and doing what I was doing, you are dead in the water or frozen in the snow, however you want to look at it. <laughs> and so without a car and having fallen in love with Russia and done my due diligence, I knew on my social security retirement, and two small pensions from short years in 
governments in Maine and Arizona that I could live frugally in Russia. And so in March of 2020, I decided that I would move to Yalta in the Crimea where I would continue my advocacy for Russia and the Russian people to try to educate people wherever they were in the West, quote unquote West, but in America especially, that Russia is not the enemy. Now, I'm looking forward to answering questions when I finish in, with my next session, but I title this, who are these Russians and why do we hate them? And I made a film about that and that's the title. It's on Alfredo Baldic on YouTube. Who are these Russians and why do we hate them? Because I was trying to show to Americans where this demonization and hatred had come from. Now, everybody listening to this is probably in a capitalist country. And so any talk of communism or the Soviet Union is off limits. It's not to be accepted. But when I came here for the first time in 2016, I discovered that Russia in its major cities is a capitalist country with a capital C. I found that Moscow was more capitalized than New York City, even Los Angeles, California, or Chicago, or Miami Beach. And people find that hard to believe unless you've been here. But I think the hatred and the demonization started with the Soviet Union. It started with the Soviet Union and communism between the so between the, the revolution in 1917 and 1991 with the collapse of the Soviet Union. People might relate to World War II. In American history, in Western history, we taught were taught that America and Europe united to win the war against Nazi Germany. Completely false. The Soviet Union lost 27 million people with the Nazi invasion of Russia, all of the Soviet republics leading into Russia. They died of starvation. They died of murder. They died of rape. They di died of massive bombardments, carpet bombing. These people suffered. But in February of 1945, when the Atlantic Axis could see the end of the war and that Germany was defeated, thanks to the Soviet Union, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and Uncle Joseph Stalin met in Yalta, about two miles from where I live, in the Lavadia Palace, to decide the future order of the world. Unfortunately, Franklin Della Roosevelt died, and he was succeeded by his vice president, Harry S. Truman. Harry S. Truman did not trust Stalin. He did not trust the Soviet Union. And the bombs that he ordered dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August of 1945 were not to end the war. It was a message to Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union that we have a weapon that now you better pay attention to and you better fear. Now, we'll fast forward a bit. During 1962 and the Cuban Missile Crisis, anybody like me who was arrived then remembers duck and cover. Get under your desk, 
hide. These evil Soviets are in Cuba, and they have a missile that can strike Washington, D.C. within minutes. And the fear was amplified. It didn't subside, really, when John Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev decided they better call this thing off because if a nuclear conflict happens between the United States and the Soviet Union, they both knew everybody would die. Kennedy famously said, they breathe the same air that we do on this tiny planet. They love their family and their children like we do, and they want nothing but the future and prosperity for themselves. We have to end this. And we were involved then in the Vietnam War, and there was the fear of the spread of communism in Central, in South America, in Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Eisenhower, LBJ and Nixon all talked about the fear of the domino effect of one country falling after another for communism. During the same period, those of you who are my age will certainly remember J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, he saw a communist under every doorstep. Senator Joseph McCarthy, he was condemning and calling before the Senate people in Hollywood, people who were suspected of being pro-communist, pro-Soviet, ruined their careers. And the current CIA director at that time, William Casey, helped to create this mass hysteria. All of you will remember, I am sure, Ronald Reagan was the president from 1981 to 1985, his words in describing Russia, the Soviet Union at that time, as the red menace, the evil empire, the focus of evil in the world, a godless nation, and we entered into an arms race. Reagan's plan, his dream for Star Wars, missile defense system. This incited so much fear, and I believe hatred and distrust of Russia, the Soviet Union, and all of its leaders to this day. That has still not dissipated. Many of you know about Zbigniew Brzezinski, fierce anti-communist. He was a counselor to Lyndon Johnson and, and to, uh, to Jimmy Carter, fierce anti-communist. Up until his death, he still had an enormous influence in American U.S. government and think tanks in the United States. And then there was Henry Kissinger under Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford between 1969 and 1977. Fiercely distrustful of the Soviet Union and Russia. And when the Soviet Union finally collapsed, when Mikhail Gorbachev in August of 1991 dissolved the Soviet Union, it ended not only the Soviet Union, but communism in Russia. What a lot of people don't know but Russians certainly remember, was in the 1990s under George Herbert Walker Bush and his Harvard economic boys, led by Jeffrey Sachs, they imposed their shock therapy on the Russian economy under Boris Yeltsin, who was by then a CIA asset a puppet of the United States. What did that lead to? It led to the privatization of Russian assets. It created a class of oligarchs who still control Russia's major industries and banks. It led to the death of more than one million people from starvation, 
suicide, alcohol, and drug addiction. It led to extreme poverty. This was neoliberal austerity. We're going to show them that they have to reform. Widespread unemployment, the non-payment of wages and pensions. It led to food scarcities. There were bread lines all over Russia. And it led to a period of extreme violence and chaos. Jeffrey Sachs was the architect of that shock therapy on the Russian economy. The Russians remember, the Russians will not forget, but many Americans today on the so-called left have found Jeffrey Sachs as their new poster boy. He's speaking against the government. Well, in my opinion, he was an asset of the United States government, the powerful globalist elite in the 1990s, and I believe that he has controlled opposition today. Now, why do I mention this? Well, George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton, who followed him, recognized that there was so much chaos and lack of organization in Russia under Yeltsin. Yeltsin was forced to resign and to appoint an unknown, the head of the FSB, the successor of the KGB, Vladimir Putin. They thought they controlled, could control Putin. He had proven himself as a good, effective, organized manager. But little did they know that Vladimir Putin led a faction of traditional, conservative, patriotic Russians who wanted to save their country. That was in the year 2000. My friends, in the last 23 years, under Putin's government, and it is not Putin alone, Putin does not, he's not a dictator. He's a powerful organizer and manager, but he's not a dictator. Under their control, Russia kicked out the United States and Russia in the last 23 years has risen from the ashes of the destruction that was brought about by the United States of America. This is the foundational, this is the root cause of America's hatred and demonization of Vladimir Putin for what he has done and stood for for the last 23 years. Now, if you haven't seen Vladimir Putin's speech at the 2007 Munich Security Conference, you've got to find it online, easily searchable on YouTube. He called out the United States publicly for repeated violations of international law and the UN Charter, and he did it in front of John McCain and Joseph Lieberman sitting in the front row. With that speech in 2007, Putin became indisputably Russia's, America's public enemy number one. Certainly from that time, Putin has been a marked man. We'll fast forward to 2016, Russiagate, Hillary Clinton, fabricated, all of that. Robert Mueller's special counsel investigation was an, in, in, uh, an investigation into Russian meddling in the 2016, 2016 election where Donald Trump defeated Hillary Clinton. All of that has since been proven false, totally fabricated. And finally, in the year 2024, 
actually 2022, when Russia conducted its special military operation, they do not call it a war, on Ukraine, to liberate the people in the Donbass and to save them from 10 years of genocide. Putin was accused of illegally an unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. The American public has been fed all of these lies for my entire life. I'm 78 years old. I remember all of it. I didn't know it at the time, but I do now. Now I have to tell you this, and I'll finish on this note. One of the biggest lies is that Putin was unprovoked in entering into Ukraine and trying to end this massacre. I'm giving you a brief history lesson now, and then we'll stop and we'll have a conversation, I hope. The Soviet Union was provoked on August 6th and 9th in 1945 when Harry Truman dropped the bombs on Japan. February 9th, 1990, Secretary of State James Baker promised Mikhail Gorbachev that NATO would not move one inch eastward towards Russia. In 1994, Bill Clinton immediately broke that promise. It was not an oral promise. It's been proven that it was written down, and it's been found in the archives of the UK, Great Britain, and the United States. Clinton began to move east. And since that time, NATO has expanded to 14 former Soviet republics, placing missiles in Poland and Romania. Ever since that time, the United States and NATO have been conducting annual military exercises, wargaming, an attack on Russia, all along Russia's border. Right here where I live in the Black Sea, they have airplanes that are flying just outside the territorial limits. They have ships that have been here in the Arctic. And this year, the largest mil NATO military exercise conducted and run by the United States, will take part beginning next month and lasting until April. 90,000 troops is part of the biggest military exercise since the Cold War. It's called Steadfast Defender 2024. It'll include, in addition to 90,000 troops, over 1,000 combat vehicles, 80 aircraft, 50 naval vessels from all 31 NATO member states, as well as Sweden, who's begging to get into NATO. And then we go to 2014. A provocation? The coup d'etat in Ukraine, in Kiev, funded, orchestrated, commanded by the United States of America, was not a provocation of Russia. Ukraine, wanting to become a member of NATO, which was Russia's red line. This was a line that could not be crossed. Forty former Soviet republics now in NATO, if that's not enough of a provocation, Ukraine on Russia's immediate doorstep with ethnic Russians, Russian-speaking people in many parts of Ukraine, this was the ultimate provocation. This was all under the administration of Barack Hussein Obama and Joseph Biden. When people say 
that this was an unprovoked attack if they will be objective and honest and look at what I have just presented to you, a brief history of the relations between the United States, Soviet Union, and Russia, and look at the provocations, the threats to Russian sovereignty since 1945, it's undeniable that the United States is the aggressor. United States is the enemy. People are waking up now that the United States is the enemy in Gaza. As I mentioned at the beginning, it's unfortunate that people have not connected the two, but it's a must. Maybe David can write a song that will connect the two. Now, I would like to end with this last statement. For any of you who for the last three years of Joseph Biden's administration, if you've been paying any attention to that, Biden, Blinken, Jake Sullivan, Lloyd Austin, and a cabal of others have all clearly stated the following things. They want regime change in Russia, get rid of Putin. They want to weaken Russia. They want to balkanize Russia. And why? They never tell you this, but this has been the reason why the United States has been conducting its military ventures around the world was to steal the resources of other countries, Central, South America, Europe, Philippines, Asia. It's always been about the theft of land and resources. I want to thank you for listening to me. Um, you know, I'm really safe behind my computer, uh, six or 7,000 miles away over here in the Russian Federation. Um, but I'm happy to have a discussion with you, uh, to listen to you. Uh, I'm more interested in listening to you than I am in you really asking me questions, but I'm happy to do that as well.